Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners, macabre murders and captivating crimes from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tale that we tell. And it's episode 199. 199. There we go. One away. One away. The big 200, in mm. case anyone can't yes, count. Yes, exactly. I guess no one's ever heard that before. No one's We've heard that We've been saying before. it for the past three months, really. It's a thing to focus on, isn't it? Exactly. But 199, we are ready, we are poised, we're okay. I have a strange voice because I have a cold. Sinead is dripping everywhere. It's horrible. Oh, it is, yeah. Yes, yeah, coughing, yeah. spluttering, dripping, but she's here. <laughs> I'm here. She's here, I'm knocking here. back a bottle of tequila to keep her going. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's one of those where I don't know if it's a cold or hay fever. But it's one or the other. Yep, there's something going round. Pollen. Pollen is what's going round. But how are you, Nick? I'm all right. You're all right. Fine, fine, fine. We're ready to go. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> so no, come on, let's get, let's get through this. I've got some Lego to build. Oh, you've got Lego to build, yeah. haven't you? As the new Dungeons and Dragons, and Dragons Lego and Dragons. arrived. It's here. It's, me. it's over it's there. I, I moved it. It's over there now. Oh my God, that's massive. It's huge. That's a big dragon. That's a big dragon. It's very exciting. Where's it going to go? I don't know yet. <laughs> Your day, sort don't of. We need to, to whiz through this because I've got Lego to build. <laughs> well, we shall also say that we keep referencing episode 200, which is coming up. So if you're listening to this in real time, episode 200 is where we're going to do a big retrospective over the last couple of years and really over the whole show for all of the thousands of new followers that we have. We are going to do some fun stuff. We're going to make some stuff. We're going to have some little treats. We're going to answer your questions and we're also going to relay some of your highlights. And your scary moments and your funny moments. What we've done for this is that we've created a little form that is in the links on our social media, on our Instagram. If you need information, you can DM us at any time and you can email us to send your thoughts or please fill out those forms if you've seen them on social media. If you need a hand, just message us. Because the more we get from you, the more content we have that we can relay from your beautiful, beautiful fans. Yes, I know how to read those things, don't I? Don't worry, I'll furnish you with information. Brilliant. Tell me what to do. Uh, Westby and I shall be there. I I will give you a booklet and I'll be like, this this is what we're doing. (laughs) This is what you need to do. This is what you need to prepare. Excellent. Yes. uh, Well, any poisonings this week? Oh, my arms. What's wrong with your arms? I, I I had a couple of jabs the other day. Did you? Yeah, I did. And I, then I lost my, used my arms for about an hour. What did you have jabs? Oh, I had some vaccine things. And they got one in each arm. And then I was walking around going, oh, my arms don't <laughs> <laughs> so, poison my, I was very much like, it was a far show. Was it the teenage boy? Kevin. Kevin yeah. from the far oh, show. Uh, the Harry Enfield <laughs> show. Harry Enfield. Um, <laughs> sort of swinging his arms around the place. <laughs> so I was like, my arms don't work. What's going on? Oh, dear. So oh. I poisoned my arms. But no, they're better now. Oh, no, they're better. They're yes. full of loveliness. They're oh, no, of... don't tell the conspiracy theorists that. They'll be like, no, you put poison in your arms. <laughs> no, the government is following yes, you. Yes, indeed. I've got tiny trackers now in each arm. Exactly. And this is why women won't sleep with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are other reasons for that. <laughs> <laughs> not according to the incels, they're not. Not according to them. Incels, if you're listening, don't. <laughs> you ain't going to like what you hear. There's a girl here. It's a girl with thoughts and feelings. She's not in the kitchen. <laughs> well, speaking of dead arms and uh, women being in their rightful places, <laughs> I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Absolutely, because they very much are in the right place. So thank you very much this week to Jill Adams. To Nocturnal Bogwitch. Excellent name. To Stephanie Rainbow. To Chaos Pixie. To Ashley Huggins Bowlin. To Hatchet Mouse. To, well, Vera didn't do it. <laughs> Bet you did. And to Sierra Headloff. Hurrah! Hurrah! Thank Many you. Patreons. Beautiful, beautiful names. Excellent names. Patreons. Oh, yes, yes. A few people message going, oh, I've used a funny name. I don't like. <laughs> we very much appreciate that. You can always use your real name, but the more creative your names, the more fun it is for us. Quite. We can build little stories around you. It does something like that is a whole ragtag of misfits. Oh, most definitely. One. Yes, yeah, and yeah, yeah. whatever she says, Vera definitely fucking did do it. <laughs> <laughs> and also like putting in the ellipses in there. Well, Vera no. didn't do it. <laughs> We know one thing. Good, we're narrowing it down. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Thank you so much, you sexy, sexy, beautiful Patreon subscribers. We had fun this week on Patreon. You told a little tale of a bank heist. I did a bank heist. The Missouri Kid. The Missouri Kid. It's not often that we have kids on the show. This is true. Yes, but we told his tale. We told his tale. We told it well. Through the route of the detective who caught him. 
Yes, uh, yeah, the old timey words from the old timey crime. Interesting approach. Liked it. It was good fun. Yes. If you want to know what the hell we're talking about, please consider joining us on patreon.com forward slash the poisonous cabinet where you get extra episodes every week. You get lots of bonus content. There is a higher tier where you get a little gift pack from us as well as an extra monthly episode and little tiny behind the scenes snacks every week. The after dark snacks where we do a little warm up of each episode and the cyanide connoisseurs get to hear that. And it's generally rambling. It generally goes a bit blue lot for no reason it's before we've even started drinking but us warming up involves our minds yes. dumping out weirdness it's a lot of filth mainly yes mainly <laughs> if you want to know about sentient guillotines and uh... <laughs> forgot about that <laughs> i don't think anyone's forgotten about that no that is the place to be also for five dollars a month the general tier on patreon it really helps to support the show and helps us keep doing what we're doing we also have a shout out this week mm. from one of our beautiful Patreon subscribers to another Patreon subscriber oh. and another person who may become a Patreon subscriber, but is probably benefiting from all the Patreon subscribers this person <laughs> knows. It is from lovely Retro Rosie, and she wants to do a shout out to her best friend and also her husband, who she assures two separate people. It's okay. You can marry your best friend, you know, <laughs> because around the time this episode comes out, they both have birthdays. They have back to back birthdays. So we've got her best friend who is Tea with Tiffany on Patreon and Retro Rosie's husband, Kevin. They have back to back birthdays, the 12th and the 13th. They love the podcast. They can't wait for the 200th episode. They're going to be hosting a poison party with lots of cocktails. <laughs> and they say, thanks for being so Can fabulous. we do that? How <laughs> would to do that? We're gonna. We're literally gonna. They say, thanks for being so fabulous. Listening to murdery stories gets me through a lot of work days. Thank you so much. Chris Grooms, a.k.a. Retro Rosie. We are delighted to give you a shout out. Happy birthday. Merry to birthday. Merry nearest birthday. and dearest. And yes, for episode 200, I know we keep going on about it because it's a big thing mm. in our heads. Do host your own listening parties. I'm loving it. Yeah, even if it's a solo listening party or people in your house, just when you're listening to the episode, get cocktails together, get some snacks, dress up, send us pictures of you enjoying it and just hashtag the poisonous cabinet. Dress That's up as your favourite you poisoner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as your favourite poison. As your favourite cocktail. You could do that. You could do that. You could dress up as your favourite cocktail. Yeah, you could. They're only just red. Just red. Yeah, it's sexy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Nick, are you ready? God knows. To drink cocktails and talk about poison. Probably. Or... We could drink poison and talk about cocktails. Okay, let's do that. Okay, I can do that this week because I've got a cold. <laughs> and it's quite sexy. But then sometimes it turns into a teenage boy. Yes, and that's less sexy. <laughs> it's like, I love you. Do you go with the first one? Yes. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is my story this week. And we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. No. Yeah. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell. And it will flavor our cocktail of the week. So, Nick... Mm. This week's secret ingredient is biscuits. Biscuits. The biscuit. I love a biscuit. A biscuit. Biscuit. Yes. Any particular type of biscuit? Well, it is the British biscuit. The, the British English biscuit. biscuit. The Irish biscuit. The biscuit of the European, not the American biscuit. Right. Because American biscuits are like a kind of a savoury scone yes, you use to sop up that. your gravy. Yes, no, none we're not of having that. that. It would be equivalent of cookies in yes. America. But the actual type of biscuit I'm talking about is is wildly disappointing. But <laughs> biscuits. I gave biscuits. you biscuits. Biscuits. Delicious. Crumbly goodness. Crumbly, crumbly biscuits. What's your favourite type of biscuit? The favourite type of biscuit? Yeah. Oh, that is a very good question. I enjoy, I enjoy a good shortbread. Mm. A chocolate dipped shortbread. Oh, fancy. Very good. I don't fancy. have biscuits a lot. I don't really mm. have them in the house because I have them in the house. They, they're going to be eaten. They, yeah, they don't last long They, they don't house. last long. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I should have yeah. a packet for guests. But also yeah. my husband would just go, these are mine now, <laughs> yes. and then inhale them. No, those, are, you know, the humble chocolate digestive. Well, you can't go wrong with the chocolate Dark digestive. Dark or milk. I don't mind. Mm. I, I'm controversial. I like a Garibaldi biscuit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, a little chewy. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. What's your favourite biscuit? We, we all know I love a ginger. <laughs> but back to the biscuits, Nick. <laughs> a ginger snap. I a ginger think. snap. Ginger snap. <laughs> <laughs> You like a ginger snap? I like a ginger snap. Okay, absolutely. Nice. Oh yeah, I mean you can't again. You can't go wrong with a good old digestive. Mm, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's a absolutely. good dunk. It's a dunking. Good damn good biscuit. Anyway, <laughs> oh, he's going to ask. No, it's really important. Okay, go on then. It's really important. Is it really really important? It's really important. Right. Can you enjoy a biscuit without tea? Oh god, yes. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Do you don't feel like the biscuit is intrinsic to the tea? No. Okay. What would be the perfect non-tea biscuit then? I, mean, I, I have no issue with digestive. 
Yeah, just 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 some nice just, just digestive. Just or those. if I'm going with that, then probably some sort of sort of like chocolate chip cookie or something like that. Yes, a chocolatey nutty gooey, cookie, gooey kind of. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Is, is a good one. You don't necessarily need tea with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. I I, say. Most of the others, though, you need that. You need that hot beverage for the dipping. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry, that was vitally important. Yes, absolutely. There we are. So this that's... week we're having tea and biscuits. Yay! <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm not well. That would work well. And no, 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 no. Don't you lie to us. So this week, we are having a chocolate biscuit. A chocolate biscuit? A chocolate biscuit. Oh, really? Yes. Is it called, it's called a chocolate biscuit? It's called a chocolate biscuit. A chocolate biscuit. Yes. Oh, God, that's horrible to say. A chocolate biscuit. Chocolate. Ooh, ooh. When you really pronounce chocolate with all the vowels, it's not... Oh, your lips don't touch your teeth chocolate. on that, do you? <laughs> Whatever one of them. Excellent. I have high hopes for this. Marvellous. Biscuit related or none. I think it is high time for us to slink into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So Nick. Yes. <laughs> a chocolate biscuit. A chocolate biscuit. It is a beautiful drink. Yes. And you floated a biscuit on Put top of it. Put a biscuit on top. And could it be a chocolate digestive? <laughs> it's a chocolate biscuit. <laughs> This is the first time there's been an entire biscuit in a drink. I know. I know you're trying to up your game with garnishes. Just but chuck a biscuit in it's there. Pretty extra- it's pretty extreme. Does the recipe call for this? Well, the recipe actually calls for a bourbon biscuit. A bourbon. I didn't have any bourbon biscuits. I do enjoy a bourbon biscuit. So I, that is I, a solid I had, biscuit. But I did have a chocolate digestive with but the But I will accept it. Um, I'm and glad it is- you approve. Okay, so this is... <laughs> I'm hoping so. It's a lovely brown drink. Very brown. It doesn't look creamy. No. But it looks fun immediately. So what do we do? Do we eat the biscuit or sip, sip Which, through the biscuit? Whatever is your preference. All right. I'm going to try and sip around yes, the biscuit. Yes, I, I agree. I'm going to give the... The, the biscuit a chance to soak up the wonder. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're going to sip and then there's going to be the mukbang. Kind of like <laughs> bit. I don't know if that's the right word. All right. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Ooh. Oh, yeah. That'll clear my sinuses. Oh, that's quite nice. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. And it does have a biscuity twang. It was a fucking biscuit. <laughs> I'm not sure the, the biscuit imparts that much flavour into the drink. No, no, it does. I, I think you'll find my palate is quite refined. I'm used to such biscuity goodness. I should have ground um, them up and made it into a biscuit smoothie. Oh my God, why aren't we doing that? Or just a crumble, a crumb, a crumb on the top of it. Okay, we're doing it again. That's quite pleasant. That is, it's boozy. It's got a nice chocolatey feel to it. I can tell it's strong because it's going places without burning my face off. <laughs> okay. I like that. Oh, I have to guess now. Don't I? You, yeah, that's, that's, that's how this is played. Okay, so this is quite bourbon? Nope. A bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> no, neither. So, uh, whiskey? <laughs> no. No whiskey? No whiskey. Rum? Nope. What? <laughs> <laughs> cognac? Yes. Oh, cognac? Cognac. Calvados? Nope. It's never a Calvados every time I bloody try. Oh, okay, so cognac. Cognac. It got red vermouth in there? Nope. Has it got other, other ingredients? There are <laughs> right. other things in there. Coffee? Yes. Yay. Okay, I thought coffee would give the chocolate genius. Now, is there chocolate liqueur in here as well? Yes. There is? Yes. Okay, so creme de cacao? Yes. Have you done the blanc? Go I've done the blanc, because that's what I have in the car. I don't have, ah, I don't I have, have the brown. I have brown at home. Yes. No, the blanc's better. The blanc's better. Yeah. Okay, so chocolate, coffee. Cognac. I'm drunk already. That's it. That's it. That's it. Oh, is that it? That's and, it. And a biscuit. And a biscuit. And a biscuit. And a biscuit on top. Oh, it's very good. <laughs> yes. It's very nice. Three things with a biscuit on top. Okay, great. I, I, I can't resist, Nick. I've got to dive in. She's going the in for the biscuit. I'm going in for the biscuit. I think this is probably not the drink for me to have once I've had two active feds. <laughs> Spaced over time, I should add. Space out your meds, people. Oh, that's quite nice. That is nice. <laughs> boozy, boozy biscuits. <laughs> Do you want more biscuits just to dunk in there? <laughs> no, I'm going to dump this one. I've bitten off the edge because the bottom of it had soaked up the booze, but now I've I've released the innards of the biscuit. <laughs> I've got a greater surface area to absorb. Well, yeah, the but cognac. also to, to to break up the outside so it gets into the cracks now. So yeah, so now I'm gonna do a proper dunk <laughs> and do because you know I but I dip biscuits into my booze all the time. You've seen me do this. Yes, you're on every time I have a biscuit. I I dip it into red wine, dip it into a little liqueur as they do in Italy, as it should be. Oh. Mm, See, the me. chocolate topping helps, co- keeps it together. Trust me, dip it, mm. now you've bitten into it. Because that booze is now just going all the way through that biscuit. There are people you know, basically losing their minds now about how erotic yeah. this is or how disgusting it we'll is. We'll be back in half an hour, so just keep going. <laughs> the biscuit eating section is over, yes. people. Because we had to <laughs> The biscuit all. section. The biscuit, the biscuit, the biscuit. Always a Black Books reference. The biscuit. The biscuit. Special biscuit. Special, special biscuit. <laughs> that is delightful. Should we, in season five, should we have a cocktail and biscuit section? 
I think so we, we now have a secret ingredient. And we have to have a biscuit as well that relates to the case. Oh, that is, that a is an idea. and a snack. I think we could encourage people <laughs> to do a pairing. Every time we do the cocktail, they can do a pairing for it. Maybe they can pair a non-alcoholic if they want to. We can enjoy that on the side. We can also pair <laughs> with some with biscuits, with treats or snacks and say, I think this would go well with this and we'll have some. Yeah. Okay. We'll have the little nibbly hour. <laughs> <laughs> hour sorry what was that yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> i can spend a long time with my food yes i would say <laughs> yes i can i will savor every bite we will have a look at that one. <laughs> oh well there we go the chocolate the chocolate the biscuit. chocolate biscuit chocolate biscuit is a resounding success it is delicious it is strong i've, I've cleared my sinuses Excellent. right up glad to hear it but now i have to read words you do this is true well with a chocolate biscuit firmly in hand <laughs> you stroll down the street yes are you ready for your story yes as this is our last proper story of yes. season four, before we do our retrospective, I thought we needed to end with a bang. Okay. You know what? Maybe in a blaze of glory. <laughs> Some might even say a great big burning bull. You know what? It's the Great Fire of London. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Great Fire of London, Nick. The great Fire of London. I could build this up for a long time yes. and it would do no good. No, because no. everyone already knows what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> Some people listen to this on loop and they go, what the fuck? <laughs> Yes, the Great Fire of London. We've talked about this before, oh, and right. and his no, we've talked about doing this episode. Oh before, right, okay. And people were wildly <laughs> in favour of it. An historical event in it history. Sixteen sixty six. Well done, you. I Lots remember that of, from school. <laughs> from school, everyone was taught. <laughs> we were all taught things about the Great Fire of London at school. Oh, that's all I remember. And there was Parmesan involved. Turns out most of them were wrong. Yeah. And then they gave us no other information on that. It went goodbye. That's it. Walked away. Wasn't a baker. But, mm, Oh, ooh, ooh, interesting. Okay, interesting. We'll, find, okay. Well, we'll find I'm well, sure we'll find out. <laughs> I'm going to be testing your knowledge all okay. the way through this. But yes, 1666, we we're going to discuss the great big orangey frenzy that made the big smoke really smoking. <laughs> <laughs> was that what it was called? The great big orangey frenzy at the yes. time? <laughs> later, later down the line, it was now then the Great Fire of London. Samuel Pepys was writing there going, the great big orangey frenzy. <laughs> Charles II was going, I think you need to work on that. Yes. <laughs> what about fire? <laughs> <laughs> Evans in the back going, I've got a better one. It's like, no, shut up. You, I'm, I'm Samuel Pepys. <laughs> so, very famous story in English history, in European history, in, in world history, really. Everyone knows about the Great Fire of London. But was it a criminal act? How did the fire poison London? <laughs> That's a very tenuous link. Yeah, that's that, that, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> What crimes were committed as a result of the blaze? Yeah. And what are the myths associated with the disaster? And how many of them are true or are complete and utter bollocks? Nice. We're going to go through them We're going today. To find out as much as possible. I'm sure there'll be little bits that people still say. Oh, I heard about this. I'll start off with a great fact that <laughs> that once my ex, one of my exes, attested completely that any pineapple motif seen around London was to do with the Great Fire of London. No. No. It's Victorian. Wasn't. Yeah, yeah. He attested this until the internet was invented. Until history was invented. Until then... history, yeah, yeah. No, he saw it like no, no, no. I read it somewhere. Out, no. I read it somewhere. It was this. It was like it bloody wasn't. It really wasn't. No, it wasn't. There we are. So yeah, if you see a pineapple, don't worry. It's nothing to do with the Great Fire of London. Tell your friends. It's usually because there's a swinger nearby. Yes, mainly swingers. Mm -hmm. Victorian swingers. And we would only do the story if we could find some truly funny moments within it. With the benefit of hindsight, though, we can point and laugh at some of the idiocy <laughs> that ensued. And look at it with a wry eye. But it's a wonderful piece of history that many, many, many great historians have covered. I encourage you to read the books, watch the documentaries. But we're going to do it in our own inimitable style. Indeed. But first, some context. Right. Nick? The history of England. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of does start with that. I've got to give context because apparently that's important. Otherwise, it would just be there was a fire. and it There was a out. fire in London. <laughs> there was a fire in London. And it yeah. was quite big. It was quite big. Well, well. I know you love great things, you know, great robberies and stuff. I, I, I this is very true, I do. Yeah, you do, you do. London already had its fair share of fires. Yeah. Uh, this was not the first great fire of London. In fact, there were many great fires of London. <laughs> uh, many great, so the great fire of 1087. Okay. Yeah, the first one that destroyed St. Paul's Cathedral. There was the great fire of 1133 that started at the home, possibly, of Thomas Beckett's father. Oh, bastard. <laughs> He didn't start oh, it. Did he not? It was an accident. Yes. Well, he should have been more careful with his candles. Yes. Interesting story as well that I read on the one of the many iterations of London Bridge. There mm. was a massive shrine to Thomas Beckett 
on no. there. Yes. But we would never see it because it was burned down many, many times. Well, the whole original London Bridge, which mm. I think is quite fascinating, because you can see it in, in pictures and things like that. They had can. all the shops and houses and stuff just completely rammed full of stuff. Mm-hmm. It was a wooden structure. Which seemed very cool. To start with. Then it had lots of houses on it. They burnt down in these various <laughs> fires. Then they went, you know what? The key is here, stone, stone. But we'll still build everything out of wood on yeah. top of it. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. But then there was the Great Fire of 1212, okay. which was far more devastating than the Great Fire of London. Mm. So not the Great Fire of London, but the Great Fire of London <laughs> in 1212 ripped through the city, through Southwark, destroyed a cathedral, most of London Bridge, which had just been rebuilt. <laughs> That's going to be annoying. It had just been rebuilt. They were just nailing it, going, okay, there's nothing wrong here. It's fine. Lot, lot of people on London Bridge, exactly as he said, suspected 3,000 deaths. Ooh. as a result of that fire. Could have been more. Lots more fires. Uh, 1220, 1227, 1299. The 13th century wasn't good for fire. 16- and they were all particularly great? They were all they were, they, they, they weren't just sort of like Mrs. Jones's pan fire type thing. <laughs> no, there wasn't just one house that caught fire. These are, this is shit that devastated London again and again and again. And they all went, this one, this is the final one. This is the great one. 1633, again, knackered London Bridge before we even get to the Great Fire of London of 1666. And there would, of course, be many more to follow I'm as sure. well. It wasn't the only time there was fire. <laughs> but London 1666 does... It is a heaving metropolis now. It is. It was a heaving metropolis then. It was. It was quite built up. So, larger city in Britain. You've got a picture. This has got, at the time, 300,000 residents. And it's grown substantially in the last 30 to 40 years or so. You've got the city of London. You've got the walls around the city of London. Then you've got the, the suburban sprawl around it. You've got the Palace of Westminster as well. And you have the Thames. The Thames is there. The Thames is there. The Thames is there. It's always there. It's lovely. You have the large stone structures, of course, but also many, many, many wooden houses yes. crammed in. Very, very switched together. Absolutely crammed into all of the little side streets and everything around it. So you may have a big stone wall. You may have the Tower of London, which is mostly stone, but there's a lot of wood in it. <laughs> it's a lot of wood. You've got, a, you've got g- good stone, lots of wood adorning it. And most of the houses that are in any of the little streets in the city of London, they are so tightly packed together. But the problem is, is they also overhang. There's leanings Mm. to them. So you have a certain amount of space in the bottom that you can build and say, look, you can build a house of this size, but there's nothing to say what you do on the second or first story. So that's where you've got all these houses kind of careening into each other and overhanging sort of diagonally feel if you want to pitch that. And these houses are absolutely covered in pitch. So lots of tar, lots of thatch roofs. Oh, it's absolutely a tinderbox in there. Fighting for space. Traffic as it was back then. Chaotic. Chaotic in the streets because you're at the centre of trade and industry. You have the usual poor sanitation. You have limited running water. There are pipes under the city at this time. There are pipes. They don't do a lot, but they're there. (laughs) But they're They're there. there. They're there. (laughs) They have good intentions. The Crown had actually issued warnings the year before that houses that were being built in the city that where the upper levels are encroaching onto the streets, this is a serious fire hazard. They're saying this is a massive hazard. There were fines and penalties about to be put into place. It had started to be put into place with architects and landowners and, and building owners and saying, if you try and do anything here, we're going to fine you because this is a big risk. A little bit too late. Yes, indeed. Now, feel free to weigh in at any point of what you know about London being all gross at this time. Um, um, Okay, I shall, if I can think of anything. Now, (laughs) apart from the cramped spaces, socially and politically, things are tense. Things are tense in London in 1666. Civil War just ended. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, Charles II is on the throne. Only a few years there, Mm. and people still not happy with him. He's like, I won the Civil War. Oh, you're still looking at me funny. (laughs) (laughs) You're not a big fan of the royalty, are you? You've had the restoration. You've had all of the the good things that came out of that. You've still got a lot of anti-royalist sentiment. Also, Charles is now fighting the Second Anglo-Dutch War. So nice. we're in war with the Dutch. Well, we're more with most people throughout history, oh, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> at war with the Dutch. My, my history of the Anglo-Dutch wars, the many of them, is not great, but mainly fighting the Dutch because you both hate the French. Yes. It's a bit of that, and then siding, and then the, the third Anglo-Dutch war is, okay, we'll side with the French. No, the side French. No, the French <laughs> going to get us. That's going on. So obviously there's a lot of resource and money being diverted to sea to the naval forces who are out fighting whatever war. Whoever they various, can find, really. Yeah, whoever they can find. <laughs> Charles II going, please, no one kill me. <laughs> Louis XIV going, hmm. 
And also, big other thing that's happened in London. Mm. Big thing. Can you guess? No. Bit of a plague. Oh, there, there was that, yes. Big old plague. This is a year after the Great Plague year. Oh. So the plague the plague has been around for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not go into the full history of the plague, even though it's fascinating. It is... <laughs> maybe what, that's one for next season. Maybe that's a, maybe an extra Patreon episode or something. We can del- delve into the Black Death or the plague. There's, there's slight differences between them, but bubonic plague, so named because of the... Delightful bubos. The bubos and all the pustules that come out. Lovely. And yes, the bubonic plague has been around for the best part of 300 years, really, in England. And... It culminates in the Great Plague Year, which is 1665. It's actually sort of the beginning of 1665 up to the summer of 1666. So just before the Great Fire of London, which would take place in September. Mm. So this 18 month period of this pandemic, this is when it's at its peak, where it absolutely reigns out of control. So during this time, 100,000 people died in that 18 month period alone. In England, many, many, many more people had been killed. People are wading through, have been spending years wading through smoke, smog, shite, and now dead people. (laughs) Dead people in the street. Many of the houses that the rich had occupied are now empty because they've fled the city out of fears of the plague. But all their stuff's still there. Yeah. So their houses are ransacked and absolutely running free with rats. No one at the time really knows how the plague spreads. We Miasmas. <laughs> evil, evil smells. <laughs> it is. What's your knowledge of what were the theories of how the plague spread? Well, mainly smell, which is why you get the big old plague doctor's masks. Yeah. Which is quite good fun. So, yes, a lot, lot, of, lot of smells. Bad smells, basically. A lot of people thought the, the smog as well and the, yeah. the, the smoke. We're not quite in the smog era of the Industrial Revolution. No, not quite. But it's, it's still a thriving... Yeah. But it, it, it came in, came in through yes, through the news, through, through the, the through the smellings. Yeah, and so everyone now lives in the countryside, away from the horrible smells. Also, don't forget the comet that was spied over London in 1664, <laughs> where everyone went. That is a sign of the plague. Yes. Well, basically, a comet was seen, and then the plague came, and everyone went shit. Was it the Haley's God comet, I think that one. Was it Haley's comet? I think it was. I didn't delve too yeah. deeply. I'd, well, I've heard that it's Haley's comet. I'm not sure if that's a myth, but definitely a comet was seen, and people went shit. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, no. all the old gods are angry, <laughs> the gods throwing are rocks at us from skies. It, it do, this does figure in the Great Fire of London as well, you know, the, the fear of religion, the fear of God's wrath. What we now know is that the plague was spread, certainly, by fleas on oh, rats. rats. Not the rats themselves, but the fleas. The oh, fleas yeah. that would bite the road and then bite people. That was the problem. May have been caused, this particular epidemic, or this strain of it, may have been caused by a contact contaminated batch of cotton coming from Amsterdam. That's damn Dutch. That's the Dutch. It's always the Dutch. <laughs> yeah, We love the Dutch, by the way. Wonderful, beautiful, beautiful people. They're blamed for everything, and it's not fair. <laughs> Back then, oh, plague doctors, quack doctors, roaming the streets, win the big outfits, going, I will give you stupid advice and stupid cures for everything you need. The government is trying to cleanse the air with big piles of tobacco, just burning that. Yeah. Yep, because tobacco clears everything up, clears Absolutely. your lungs out, clears your lungs out. Sorts you right out. Yeah, culled all the dogs and cats, let the rats roam free. <laughs> They did. They culled all the other animals and the rats were like, this is brilliant. Made it a lot worse. (laughs) (laughs) A lot, lot worse. The city has been, for the best part of 18 months, a place of red crosses on doors, of carts being wheeled through the streets, literally with the cries of, bring Bring out out your your dead. dead. But in the spring of 1666, things started to turn. It was looking a bit better. Less people were dying. <laughs> it's looking a bit less dead. A little less dead. People starting to return to the city, okay, and come back because most people's businesses in the city there, it, it's literally in the city. You can't do this shit remotely. No. Yes, you are a landowner, you are a landlord, you have tenants, your property is your livelihood. Mm-hmm. Not only your home, but your livelihood. So it's been a hell of a time. It's a hell of a year. So it would seem. And not going to get much better <laughs> from here. You know what it's also been? Very hot. More? God. Dry summer. <laughs> very, very hot and uh... very, very dry. That's got to be really gross in the city. It's not going to smell well. It's not going to smell well. Everything's dried out to tinder. Mm. Mm. So we come to the 2nd of September, mm. 1666. And to the bakery in... London. Yes. Do you know where in London? I don't, actually. We're at the bakery of Thomas Farriner. Okay. 
in Pudding Lane. Pudding Lane. Pudding it. Lane. There you go. Actually, it's just a Pudding Lane. It's a place called Fish Yard. But Pudding Lane. <laughs> why not? There's so many reports that just go, it's Pudding Lane. And one just went, actually, I think you're fine. Oh, I think you're fine. It's a small alcove. <laughs> it's Pudding Lane, everyone. It's Pudding Lane. That's what we're calling it. But yes, Thomas Farinat. Now, he is a baker. No. <gasps> now, you disputed... Bakers. Well, I'd heard that there was, it could well be him, but I thought that they arrested like a Frenchman or something like that. Oh, we should come back to that. Okay. Mm. Oh, well, bear that in mind. Yes. Don't you worry, we'll come back to it. But Thomas, Thomas Farriner. Now, he is a very successful baker. He supplies goods to the King's Navy. Nice. Yes. Now, some people call him the King's Baker. He's not necessarily giving bread to the King. No. What he is making is he is making ships. Biscuits! <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Now, you had a few options. You could have had bread, but biscuits. I biscuits said biscuits. Is fun. Now, ship's biscuits. Less they, fun. Yeah. Less. No, they're awful. Yeah, they're just That's unleavened, a, boring. It's just a solid, hard tack. Yeah. Tack, exactly. Yeah. Like lambless bread. Mm. Mm. Little nibble will sustain you, apparently. No, it really won't. <laughs> no, 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 it won't. But he's making these. But nice, dry, unleavened yeah. shit <laughs> that's going on. But does a good business. Setting up. So he has spent his day trading. He's going to finish about eight or nine o'clock at night. And he's going off to bed. He's, he's there with his wife, his daughter, Hannah. He also has a chap who works for him as well and a maid, a housemaid. Mm-hmm. So he goes off to bed. His daughter, Hannah, does the checks around. Everything is in place, they say. Everything is in place. Oh, they've got to make sure the ovens are off. There's no, yes. there's no spark or anything like that. Off they go to bed, sleep peacefully. Between midnight and 1 a.m., Thomas is woken by smoke pouring into his room. Yeah, that'll wake you. The house is on fire. The biscuits! The biscuits! No, 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 the biscuits! Save the biscuits! Save, save the, biscuits. the country! The biscuits will sustain the country! No, the, fuck the biscuits. It is later suspected that a single spark from mm. the dying embers of the oven, mm. flung out of the oven, hit all the dried goods that were there up in smoke. The house is quickly in flames. Now, Thomas and his family are trapped upstairs at this stage but they manage to climb out of a bedroom window and mm-hmm. drop to the street below it's not an insubstantial drop but they do it because of this quite large drop everyone gets out except for the maid because she's scared no. she's scared of the heights yeah she stays in the house she is the first victim oh probably the the best known victim the the most confirmed victim yes. <laughs> the most we, she definitely did she definitely did so everyone is standing out in the street the poor maid has burned to death Oof. in the building Neighbours are rushing to help, calling for aid. Now, fires aren't uncommon in no, London. No, well, indeed. Yeah, it's not going to be like, oh, my God, it's the first fire we've ever seen. Okay, right, this is a fire. It's not a, a, a great thing to see, so we'll get some water, we'll call for aid, but there's a really big problem. Mm. It's the wind. There is a wind blowing in from the east, and it is making this fire spread yeah. very fast through a very dry, very compact... Very thatchy area. ...area. <laughs> They're desperately trying to douse the fire with whatever they have to hand. Petrol! Uh, <laughs> throw some... <laughs> What's this new liquid we've got here? Very small rocks. Small, Very small, small rocks. rocks. There we are. More witches! <laughs> That's what they're doing. Someone's trying to burn a witch and they're going, please, can we not right now? We've got enough trouble on our hands. They are all fighting to fight this fire. Now, firefighters of the time, primitive mm. at best. And yes. you can't blame them. We can't look back and kind of go like, no. yeah, 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 or whatever. What have they got? They've got carts of water. They have they have carts with huge tanks of water in them. Make and the best pump. of what you can, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. But these carts are huge and it's very cumbersome yeah. and you're trying to get through the streets where and everyone is moving. Uh, yeah, massive crowds are forming so you can't get the bloody yeah. carts to people. Exactly. There are pipes under London which should have stopcocks mm. so you mm. can gather water from them but they're, they're temperamental mm. at best so it doesn't always work so you're trying to throw whatever you can at them another option though the biggest option is okay how do you stop a fire spreading in this sort of area if you can't if you're not going to use water if water's not cutting it i sort of give it nowhere to spread to exactly so burn down the building next door pull down the building <laughs> yeah. next to it yeah so pull destroy, down the building and then yeah well, that's what they do with like fire breaks isn't it on the fields yeah. and things so this is exactly it fire yeah. breaks this is what you need to stop a fire mm. from spreading they need to pull down the surrounding houses big sticks with hooks on the end pull them down it's not going to be a pretty job but give the fire nowhere to go yeah. but you can't just do that you can't just pull down houses. someone's house <laughs> Exactly. My because, house, mate. Yeah, Fuck off. It's not, it's not going to be the Bank of England you're pulling down. <laughs> but these are people's livelihoods. Yeah. And these are tenants. Some of them are not here. Some of them are out of town. Pretty easy if they're not there. Well, yeah, but also them. they can rock up and say, you pulled down my house without my permission. 
compensation. Wow. Yeah, give me compensation. That or London burns. (laughs) At the time, (laughs) this is the crucial time during the fire. Right now, this is contained Mm. in an area. No one knows what's going to happen, but they're like, "Can can we break this? But without having the authority to pull down these houses, they have to go to one man. They have to go to the Lord Mayor of London, Mm. Sir Thomas Bloodworth. Nice. Yes. Mayor is not happy about being woken up. No, no. He's like the captain of that ship that didn't help the Titanic. (laughs) Yeah, he's woken up. Oh, my God. I have to get up and do my duty. God, there's a fire. Grumble, grumble, grumbles down to the point. And he looks at the site and the authorities, the firefighters are saying, we, we need to start putting down houses. You need to give us authority to do this. Words to that effect. Yeah. He, this is impressed upon him. He is weighing up at the time of this fire. Fires happen. Fires go out. Do I risk massive damage to these houses and the wrath of the owners? Mm. And he makes his decision and it would go down in history of him scoffing that the fire... A woman might piss it out. <laughs> he says that, turns on his heel, goes back to bed. Mm. Yeah. He says, there's nothing to this fire. People there covered in soot. A maid has died. <laughs> He's screaming out the window. Yeah, He's like, no, a woman could piss it out. But that's a maid. <sighs> also, a woman could piss it out. Oh, we've got weaker piss than you. That would squash over it. Oh, you fucking bastard. <laughs> So they're like, okay, we can't pull down any houses. Mm. This decision is credited as a very bad one. Yes, I, really. I would say so. <laughs> um, and there'll be all sorts of backs and forth later on. Not a on. wise move. But yeah, there's these crucial times of how you can t- contain this fire. As a result, the fire rages. It is carried mm. by this very strong wind to the adjoining houses. It is soon spreading through the street and further streets towards the River Thames. Now... During the night, the fire is starting to, to, to obviously be seen <laughs> from far away. One Samuel Peeps lives to the east of the blaze. Mm. Ah, Samuel. We know Samuel. Now, he is currently upwind, his location. Mm. So he's not in the blast zone, as it were. <laughs> but he's woken up by his wife. Because you know what? Samuel Peeps loves nothing more than to write shit down. Yeah, absolutely. That's a bit of drama. Yeah. He also is woken up and he's like, oh, fuck off. I don't care about It's fires. only a fire. It's only a fire only a fire so he sleeps peacefully through the night <laughs> wakes up looks out the window shit <laughs> equivalent of why that. didn't you wake me <laughs> i tried you bastard you said give me five more minutes and then you farted for 10 minutes he wakes up because everyone's going you really need to get up because this is really bad word is spreading around london so sort of by the early hours of the sunday he hears that this fire has swollen and by this time 300 houses have been consumed Mm. and he leaps into action he starts to journal what's happening he takes his position at the tower of london which is not near the blaze at the point and probably quite secure as well being mainly made of stone mainly made of stone a lot of lot of wood (laughs) and a a nice moat as well (laughs) still a lot of wood all around it the tower of london is like we're fine we're 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 fine we're fine it it seems to be getting closer now we've got a day a day mate at least (laughs) Once down there. You don't want the fire to reach the Tower of London because that's where all the gunpowder is. <laughs> and lions. Yes. You don't want lions running around on fire as well. But Samuel Pepys is on the battlements of the Tower of London. There was one report that said a man took to the battlements, looked at the fire and died of fright instantly. <laughs> Because it's a sight. This it's is quite a, a sight. dramatic sight. This Absolutely. is a very dramatic sight. In, tw- in 1212, no one had pens back then and couldn't j- journal it as well as Samuel Pepys did. Because probably it was a lot of people dying of shock then. But he takes his position, he and other spots along the river during the day, to recount what is happening. Now, you mentioned something at the beginning about Samuel Pepys. Let's get it out of the way. Oh, and his parmesan. His parmesan. That he buried his parmesan. He did bury his parmesan in the garden and it was some m- wine. And Yes, because it's the most valuable thing he had. Forget the wife and child. <laughs> <laughs> bury the parmesan. He did this on about day three <laughs> to four. He didn't do it instant. I would love the no, idea it's that instant. he was woken up. He shoved his wife out of the way, having slept with his arms wrapped around his parmesan, hurtled into the garden, kicking his kids as he went, <laughs> burying the parmesan and some wine because you need wine to go with the cheese. Well, absolutely. Um, he did indeed, though, bury his parmesan with his friend's stockpile of wine. But it was very much after he had secured his possessions and his children and his <laughs> wife like we can we can escape if needs be you're fine the cheese i'm gonna i'm gonna age in the ground for some why reason they, if, if he's got his family out of the way out of harm's way why don't they just take the cheese with them 
Maybe he kept it from his wife. Perhaps it's a secret tree. Secret this is, that was his, that was his affair. His cheese. own <laughs> secret stash of parmesan. <laughs> his wife's been going, you need to order more parmesan. No, oh, no, no more parmesan. <laughs> Children, but daddy, we love parmesan. No, there's no parmesan. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's there at night going, ah, yeah, <laughs> Grating it over his gruel. <laughs> oh, my God. My secret parmesan stash. It's his secret par- that, that is his secret runaway stash of money, his emergency <laughs> parmesan. <laughs> But no, that is true. It doesn't happen the first instance that he hears the threat of fire. What we know of the fire, a lot of them are from his accounts and other great writers of the time. And he describes the fire whipping through the city. He witnesses people desperately trying to save their possessions and run. And people staying indoors to the last minute, literally as the fire is kissing their houses. Mm. That's the last... Because they've got everything in there. And how can they carry it? How can they get out? Now, many people thinking there's one big thing in London that could solve all their problems, that could stop the fire. There's a big river. Big river. There's a big river. Big old river. It runs through the middle. Fire can't get across Famously water. wet. Yeah. Yes, famously wet. You know what else the Thames is famous for? Trade and industry and importing stuff. And all along the riverbanks are just huge caches of tar and yeah. tack. And all sorts of lovely, lovely, Lots of gunpowder. <laughs> yes. Lots of stuff. Warehouses loaded with equivalent of warehouses loaded mm-hmm. with all of these things. So those things are going to go up like a Christmas tree as well. Yeah, gunpowder as well, as you said. People no. have also been stockpiling still since the restoration. Just in case. Yep. In their cellars, they've all got all this stuff in there and like... Oh, shit, shit, shit. That's not helping no. some of the houses. They're like, oh, this is wonderful tinder. <laughs> the fire is having a lovely day. If the fire had feelings. <laughs> the fire at its peak is burning very, 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 very hot. Estimate, one estimate. I don't know how this was worked out. About 1,700 degrees Celsius. That's quite hot. And given that it takes around about 1,200 degrees Celsius, I believe, to burn a human body. Fun. So it's hot. Hotty, hot, hot. You have learned from your experiments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from reading. I, I, I believe. I believe, I believe. <laughs> and as I said, then there's the tower, the great fear that the fire will hit the walls of the capital's fortress and its munition supplies because there is enough wood around it that it could spread, that it could get there. It could catch, blow the city to kingdom come. Mm. People are trying to fight the fire. It soon becomes very clear this is impossible. Yeah. This is a losing battle. They are doing their best. Peeps is called by King Charles the second how he gets this message how he how he does this it's peeps would say he was called to king charles he actually wrote it in that way i was called to king charles he fucking went in there basically <laughs> kicked down the door of the palace covered in soot i have written a journal oh jesus peeps no <laughs> oh wait actually this could be helpful but he gives his account and it's a very detailed account you know is you know his his great skill and the king says the houses around the area have to be pulled down They have to be pulled down. Tell the mayor, tell the authorities, they have to be pulled down. The hell with the mayor's judgment, if needs be. But go and make sure that he's doing that. King Charles is also going, the royal guards, I'll send you the royal guards to help. He will go out on a boat later to survey the damage. Charles II is doing a great PR campaign at this point. He needs to be seen yeah. at the forefront. He needs to be offering help. This is a time as well. He's there with the hoses, right at the front. <laughs> Smiling. Smiling. Just, someone's sketching frantically. He's got a firefighter's helmet with a crown on it. He's there so you can see him. You say that he will be in the fray yeah, later. He will exactly. be in the fray on horseback, but he will be doing stuff. With, and James, future king of England as well, will be doing this. But he is absolutely trying to push himself forward. It seems like a really obvious thing to do, but this is the time, again, post um, restoration the mayor of london doesn't want to accept the king's help necessarily mm. there are people around who says no we don't want the king's god we can do this ourselves i don't want to completely position myself as a royalist or you know i'm, I'm going to mutteringly accept you here but people are very funny about accepting the king's help and he is very much trying to turn this into actually he's like, I, I need a picture of me with a smoking child really, <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> everyone's dubious Sammy Peeps would find the mayor in the street, the mayor of London, there still sort of into the early hours. It's of the fine. Day. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. Pretty much. Pretty much. Trying to control the fire. He is said to be in such a state that he is fainting like a woman. This he's is the, the woman who's pissing the fire <laughs> out. The woman who's pissing the fire <laughs> out. So, Jesus, it's hot. Insists that they can't pull the buildings down fast enough to stop the blaze, but he's definitely going to do it. He's definitely going to do it. Peeps tells him the king will send more guards, refuses the help of the king's soldiers. They can manage that. Then the Lord Mayor leaves the scene <laughs> and does not return. Yeah. Vanishes, leaves the city, absolutely fucks off. Nope. 
Nope, nothing else I can do. Do it yourselves. Don't care. Mm, not ideal. Mm. Not ideal. As I've said, the city's narrow streets have created a gridlock for carts mm. trying to bring aid to people and people trying totally. to flee the streets. Uh. More fuel for the fire to spread. There was even a report in the later days that around the city of London, so obviously you've got the wall of the city of London, you've got the suburban sprawl around it, which is affected. Guards shut the gates mm. to the walls with people trying to get out trying to say to them but you need to fight the fire and they're like we're fucking going to burn to death yeah. please let us out but like no you need to put your efforts into, into fighting, fighting the fire. fire you know there's just kind of an yeah. argument of like they're like no oh, we want to save our cheeses <laughs> well no one think of the parmesan <laughs> <laughs> the king sees from the river king charles ii as he's sailing down that houses <clears throat> are not being pulled down as the mayor has promised he overrides the mayor's authority and he sends more men to demolish whatever they can in the fire's path to create the fire breaks, aided by his brother, James. Yeah, as I said, very much PR stunt. But soon even they are out of their depths. Into the early hours of Monday morning, the fire has blackened the sky, sending debris into the air and creating vacuums of hot air down the narrow street. Yes. Pigeons fall from the sky. <laughs> Delightfully roasted. <laughs> Delightfully. <laughs> and snacks, snacks. The metal roofs of famous buildings later even St Paul's mm. would melt and run as molten into the street people are in the dark and hear nothing but the crackle and snap of their city burning around them and soon dark thoughts set in <laughs> I think that's time for a drink <laughs> my god yes <laughs> a drink with our dark thoughts Nick we have our drinks we do the fire is raging where's the parmesan the, par the parmesan is buried you need to let the parmesan go. There's okay. much more pressing things There's at more hand. important things than parmesan. Yes. Into Monday, the fire has spread north and west and starts to consume the buildings along the river, including some on London Bridge. Mm. Poor London Bridge. You can imagine someone who was just nailing something in or doing the last lick of paint going, no, 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 no. <laughs> you fuck off. Just moved all their personal <laughs> prized possessions into their new <laughs> shop and home just sweat wiped from their brow like oh they got oh shit off <laughs> luckily though luckily not because of i don't think from any kind of planning i may be wrong here but because of the rebuilding of london bridge there is a gap where there's no buildings and the fire can't jump there nice. you know it hasn't learned it's not become sentient <laughs> and everyone's like oh thank god because they're like well you burned it down seven times before wasn't there a gap that's so they could allow like big sailing ships through? Well, because it opened. Yes, uh, I'm it has, not sure I had about like that. a drawbridge thing so that allow could be it. to allow big boats and things with masts and such like through. That could be I it. Think. I may have remember. Oh, I may have been watching a cartoon. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> also, anyone when you see pictures of anyone, Fergie, and also anyone else who's singing songs about London Bridge and they're standing in front of a historic bridge. That's Tower that's Bridge. That's Tower Bridge. That's, that's Tower yes. Bridge. Shut the fuck up. No. That's entirely wrong. London Bridge now is very boring. It's very boring and made of concrete it's in the 70s. It's completely <laughs> made of... But anyway, there we are. London Moving Bridge. On. Um, the London Gazette reported on Monday morning, the first edition they got out, was that the fire, in so many words they had put, the fire was mild, would be out soon. They didn't really get to print another edition because their offices burned down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's karma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, ooh, now we're regretting that, aren't yes. we? So the fire sort of like change direction at that point when this is, <laughs> this is what? Hmm. i do like the idea that the fire is sentient and i will come on to that later because okay. according to some catholics it fucking was the wrath of god absolutely <laughs> the wrath of god the city of london is engulfed rich and poor are like a scrabbling in the streets to save their own to save their property the rich are trying to save their gold their gold because they fear <laughs> that it will melt Whereas people with less money are making a beeline for the houses that have been abandoned, ransack that <laughs> yeah. shit. I'm going to go and find that gold. <laughs> looting, looting is a, a, a rive cheap side yeah. as well, actually. It's like a big shopping district at the time. So yeah, everyone's just taking shit. Everyone is taking shit. Also, people, and it never ceases to amaze me how people can cash in on a tragedy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so there's a big fire. People are running out. You know, with all the possessions they have yeah. to the nearest car or the horse and cart that they can hire, get them out of the city, usually for a couple of shillings. <laughs> car owners put their prices up so high, they charge as much as 30 to 40 pounds for a single trip. Yeah, but people will pay it. That is the equivalent of well over 130,000 pounds yeah. today. 
That is it. Okay, if you're yeah. desperate to escape with your life, then if you've got it, you're going to pay it. Exactly. Yeah. That is like, yeah, well. And if you, you just stole it from next bitches. door, you're going to pay it. <laughs> Clip club. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't bring out the best of people already, does it? It doesn't. No, but well, people are desperate. People yeah. are desperate. And also people who are just opportunists yeah. who do not give a shit. Others kindly offering in a very kind of life of Brian with a crucifixion <laughs> kind of thing. I'm like, let me take your bags. I will be your porter and I will take these out of the city. Thank you, kind sir. Fuck off with their love. <laughs> <laughs> running out of the city never to be seen again with all of these families worldly possession pretty miserable but in the midst of the funny money grabbing people are watching their homes go up in flames and they have no idea what's caused it at the time no idea yeah. all they see is the most devastating fire imaginable ripping through the city they not only see things in flames but they see apparently fireballs in the sky landing on other buildings and those buildings catch and they don't understand what's going on other than it must be the work of terrorists it has to be an intentional fire yeah they don't they're not necessarily putting two and two together they just wind will do this i'm not saying that people in the 1600s were <laughs> stupid or anything like that but it's just the lay people in the street are seeing something so devastating yeah. this is impossible this must be an attack and it was a very very strong wind mm. that did this that carried it so far all they think is the dutch are attacking no. the dutch are attacking soon that morphs into the french are attacking soon that morphs into anyone who's not english anyone who's not english is attacking now is attacking <laughs> They're against us. They're sending, they've got incendiaries, they have got grenades, they have got firebombs, they are trying to burn London to the ground. And it again then doesn't take long for mob mentality to set in mm. and for people in the street to start attacking anyone foreign that they see, anyone they perceive to be foreign, anyone that they think is acting shifty, they will attack and break down. And this is where the murders occurred mm. during the Great Fire of London. A young boy reports seeing a Frenchman who was struck down, struck across the head with an iron bar by a tradesman from London. And the boy reported seeing the man's innocent blood pouring down mm. his body and pooling around his ankles. Another Frenchman was said to have been practically torn apart <coughs> by a crowd because he was carrying tennis balls. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous tennis balls. A, tennis balls maybe look like tiny grenades. They don't Many know. little tiny bombs. Why was that man carrying tennis balls? He was going for a match. Maybe. Maybe those were his most precious things. This this is quite gruesome. This is not pleasant. Hmm. But again, from a report way back when, young woman, French woman in Moorfields, grabbed by the mob because they thought she was carrying firebombs, incendiaries, whatever you want to call them, in her apron and her breasts were cut off. She was mutilated. Nice. She was actually carrying... Why? Small, she was carrying chicks in her apron <sighs> because she was carrying small things people apparently reacted going you are causing you are throwing bombs people thought grenades were being thrown and they mutilated this woman people are bastards mm. the attacks on anyone perceived to be foreign whether they were foreign <laughs> or not are so bad that the authorities have to to get involved and again in the same way that the authorities at the gate would stop people leaving even king charles and his guards are saying your only focus should be to stop this fire. Yeah. You need to stop trying to have some sort of divine retribution or mob mentality. You're not helping. You have to, in so many words, yeah. you have to fight the fire. It is a grim spectacle in the streets. There would be reports later as well, even after the fire had died down, of murdered people lying in the street yeah. who were perceived to be foreign nationals. Of just, yeah, let's kill them because they were responsible for the fire of London. And people believed this for a very long time. You must also, also take into account, you mentioned earlier on, people's religious feeling yeah. at the time. Many people thought, yeah, foreign enemies attacking the cities. Others, this is God's judgment. Absolutely. This is God's judgment. This is a very religious time. These are Protestants. A Protestant nation that's just kind of switched from Catholic, yeah. then also switched from nothing. Uh, yeah. Uh, Puritan. <laughs> going back and what, forth a What lot. are we? What <laughs> are we right now? And there's lots of people saying we should be one thing or another and saying this is your fault mm. as a result of it. People believing that this is God's judgment. A plague had been sent and now fire to condemn you for your sins, for greed, for gluttony, starting in a bakery. I'm saying this with authority in terms of actual <laughs> monuments and stones were written about this. Mm. And worse, this is how people are feeling and this is what's whipping people into a frenzy during the Great Fire of London. 
by the end of the Monday, we're only on Monday now. <laughs> we're only Don't worry, on. I'm not going to do day by day, hour by hour. <laughs> but King Charles and James are now in charge and they are organising the demolitions of different buildings. They ride through the streets and they break up mobs who are attacking foreigners and they get foreigners put into prison to, to protect safety, them. Safety, yeah. To safety, safety. They are saving them as they were. One report said, the Duke of York hath won the hearts of the people with his continual and his indefatigable pains day and night in helping quench the fire. One witness wrote on the 8th of September. But did he have 10,000 men? Did he have 10,000 men? I'm not sure. They all were crispy. They had wonderful towns. Did he march them up to the top of the hill? To go, oh, look at that. And when they were up, they were up. <laughs> Indeed. He was writing that rhyme while people were burning. People were burning. Room. He was there with Peeps going, what rhymes with this? <laughs> Peeps, come here, come here. I have a thought. I have a thought. I have a thought. Put You're down, a put down that bucket. Some cheese and wine would be great yeah. right now. I know you're the man to do it. The fires would continue to rage and the only way to stop them was creating these fire breaks, as we've said. On Tuesday, the fire was creeping towards the tower. Mm. The Tower of London, the garrison were champing at the bed. Please let us do this. Please let us do this. They knew what needed to be used to tackle this. Gunpowder! A lot of gunpowder. More fire! More fire. Yes, it's true. How successful it was. It was successful. Really, the well, casualty damage. The demolition. <laughs> yeah, demolition. Get gunpowder to destroy yeah. properties around the tower fuck the people inside them who cares where a few people over the years have sort of said like how many people maybe died in those houses and no one talked about yeah. it they had to stop the fire getting near the yeah. tower because that would be a disaster and it worked the tower was mostly protected some of the outside structures were a bit charred a bit, <laughs> a bit, a bit crispy it's fine st paul's cathedral it's stone. It's stone. It shouldn't have caught on fire. Loads of people put their shit inside it, but it was covered in wood and it was scaffolding. Covered in wood, yes. Because Christopher Wren was chipping away at the time. <laughs> like, I'm going to make this so pretty. Oh, shit. <laughs> yes. So the outside of the building and bits of the building were ravaged yeah. inside. It was it was a ruin to a point. It was rebuilt. Christopher Wren was like, no, I was doing it anyway. <laughs> but that is, again, one of the visions of, of the roof of St. Mm. Paul's melting and just running All the into lead, the streets. All the lead. Down. Yes. Wednesday, day three, the winds finally dropped and the fire breaks put in place begin to work. The fire slows right down and officially it stopped on Thursday, the 6th of September. <laughs> Samuel Pepys climbed to the top of the steeple of Barking Church and surveyed the damage and said it was as the saddest sight of desolation I ever saw. Mm. London was a smouldering ruin. Only a fifth of the original structures were still standing. The little fires were eventually extinguished. Some fires continued to burn for weeks mm. afterwards. Hundreds of thousands of people were homeless without their livelihoods. A huge refugee camp was set up in Moorfields Park and people were wandering around in a state of devastation. The fire officially destroyed in the region of 13,000 homes, 89 churches, the Guildhall, St. Paul's, three city gates, the Royal Exchange, and many, 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 many more places. <laughs> many there were places. too many to name yeah. that were devastated by the fire. And the properties that were owned by landlords and tenants, their biggest income, people's lives vanished in the wake of the fire. Now, officially, only eight people died. Officially. Eight people died in yeah. the Great Fire of London. This has been disputed. It's not vehemently disputed by some of the historians that I like. <laughs> <Listening>. <laughs> there, there are some others who could test hundreds of thousands, thousands of, people of people died. There are plenty of parish records that survived. However, how up to date with the parish records? You've got children who are not registered and you've got Absolutely. older people and you have the undocumented. And it's such a, I mean, such a transitory place. People coming and going, yeah. business, trade, what have you. So there's no, there's no record of who's in London now yeah. at this moment. So Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. And also, people could have been completely incinerated. Yes. And there'd be no knowledge of them. There's all of the undocumented in London mm. at that time who could have perished. So some scholars place it as probably under 100. Unlikely to be way more, I think, because I think those people would be eventually yeah. noticed as missing. But also, I mean, incredibly difficult to identify people. Yeah. When if they're, if they're mm. a, yeah, a burnt corpse Well, has the entire family the house, died? Then how on earth, even if, even if it was your neighbour, 
no, de- you couldn't do dental records or DNA testing mm. to identify these people. So who knows who the fuck they yeah. were? And a so, lot of people out of the city. Yeah. What if they're servants? What if they're housemates? Exactly. They don't matter. No one's going to know. So that's the official record. Mm. Probably a lot. Probably more. a lot more. Charles II, King Charles II, gave funds to firefighters afterwards. Gave them. Uh, money for their for their contribution mm-hmm. ensured food was supplied to all refugees he made a big effort um, he did say that the, really the greatest loss was felt by him uh, him personally absolutely yeah. he has words felt, to that effect yes. that you know people are standing there going my life is 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 in smoke yeah i have nothing left because if you have a house and you're renting it of your business that's it. There's no. Mm. There's there's nothing. You probably don't even have insurance. Oh no. You know, there was insurance at the time, but it's like yeah. no, no. But but Charles going. I feel it the most. <sighs> yes. Maybe, the walls maybe. of my castle are slightly charred. <laughs> the PR person who was like, yes, go ride out and say, yeah. well, don't fucking say that. Just what the don't, fuck are you doing? Yes, shush now. The anti-foreign feeling remained and was fueled further later in September when a French watchmaker named Robert oh. Huber yes. presented himself to the authorities. And said he had deliberately started the fire. A man admitted. Admitted to it. Admitted to it. 26 years old he was. He was apparently questioned in Essex by the authorities because he was travelling abroad. And he volunteered this information. He was brought back to London to be questioned. And he claimed, yeah, he threw a grenade into the bakery. Mm. Into the Pudding Lane Bakery as part of a French plot. He had a gang. He wanted to do it for the French. And yeah. He's happy to admit it. So when he stands trial in October 1666, and when he's questioned, his story changes multiple times. Mm. Multiple times. He changed the place where he'd thrown the grenade. He changed the details of where he was. Turns out he wasn't in England at the time. (laughs) He was on a ship. But he could have had a really good throwing arm. Really good throwing (laughs) arm. He says he's Catholic at one point. He says he's Protestant, and then he's a Huguenot. He's just, it's so messy that the Chief Justice at the time said that we cannot convict him. Yeah. A person who was just compelled to confess, whatever it is. But people need a scapegoat. Well, this is very true. They need a scapegoat. Thomas Farriner was at his trial. And he insisted everything had been done correctly in that bakery. There was no way a spark could have flown mm. out. And well, of course he's he, going to say that. Is he telling the truth? Was there a, a bomb that was thrown mm. in through his window? Was there something that was done untoward? Or was he careless and he trying to cover his back? Seems a strange place to throw a bomb. A lot of into a random fire, bakery. You're not, again, you're not going to question. We don't now. Yeah. We'll come to that. Okay. <laughs> but even though everyone says this is mad, this confession, it makes no sense. Mm. On the basis of his confession, he was convicted. Hubert was convicted of starting the Great Fire of London, and he was hanged in yeah. Tyburn on the 27th of October, 1666. I say people need a scapegoat. They do. People need someone to blame. One of the jurors would say neither the judges nor any present at the trial believed him guilty, mm. but that he was a poor, distracted wretch, weary of his life, and chose to part with it in this way. Mm. Leave that there. Yeah. Of, okay. is that convenient for everyone? Yeah. When his body was cut down, it was decreed that he his body would be given to dissection. A mob <laughs> tore it apart. Mm. A mob so determined to have a villain for the Great Fire of London, they tore it apart. Anti-Catholic sentiment continued to rise in England (laughs) as a result of this. And some people still feel that the Great Fire of London was a plot. The evil Catholics. Yes, by foreign papists. And there is a great report from Valencia in Spain that was written in 1666. And it's glorious. A couple of the excerpts read, Let those who have escaped from this punishment with their lives give their thanks to god and having recognized the true roman catholic church Mm. let them pray to god that he may spare them from a greater fire namely the fire of hell (laughs) (laughs) other great pieces written from this uh, from this report all fire and brimstone great catholic pov this report mentions a pyramid of fire raised from the sea three times in three days and also the birth of a monster in London, a horrible beast. This is all foretelling the fire. Yeah. With colour partly fiery and partly yellow, on the chest of a human face, on the legs of an ox, the feet of a man, the tail of a wolf, the breast of a goat, the shoulders of a camel, a long net, and instead of a head, a tumour with horse's ears. Oh, that's quite a monster. 
<laughs> it's a wooden. <laughs> it's a lot. It's an image. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to piece that together in my head. But, I mean, maybe fire makes those shapes, and also maybe that was there. It also the reminds of... me of one of those monsters. You know, when you were a kid, you see like fold up the bit of paper, and like <laughs> someone draws the feet, and then someone else draws the legs, someone else draws the middle bit, and stuff like that. It reminds me of like that. Oh, it's a monster. <laughs> that's that's basically how the Catholic Church that's, works. That's how they work. It is. <laughs> that's all they do in the Vatican. It's just yeah. drawing. <laughs> uh, this same pamphlet would attest that the fire stopped only because it encountered a Catholic church. It let all the other Protestant churches burn, but when it came before the Catholic Church, oh, it was quelled. I'm not sure that's true. Is do you, do you think? <laughs> do you think? Because the Pope himself was there before they <laughs> commanded the fire to go away. But in subsequent years, there was a lot of back and forth about what happened, and London was slowly rebuilt. There were still plenty of people blaming others. But what did the fire do? One of the most famous myths associated with the Fire of London, the Great Fire of London. The Great Fire of London. Was, did it wipe out the plague? Well, yeah, so that is the thing, isn't it? That it was, meant, it was meant to have killed all the rats that had the fleas that spread the plague. It was meant to, all the rats were now crispy. So, therefore, it mm. cut, off the, cut off the plague. But, yes, is that just a big old myth? According to the experts, no, it didn't. Uh, no, the plague was already declining. Yeah. It was already... also, rats are pretty smart. If they, there's some danger, they're <laughs> fucking off out of there. Yeah. They rats are leaving a sinking ship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They are faster. They're out of there faster than people and anything else. Yeah. They are scalping. Well, they go straight into the river. Yeah. So, rats can swim. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't think the rats are going to sit there and go, oh, look, we're stuck. No, um, they don't believe that it cleansed London of nah. the Black Death of the bubonic plague. It was already in decline. What the play, what the Great Fire of London did is it allowed for major improvements across the city, such as better sewage systems, better fire safeties, and would result in the London Fire Brigade yeah. being formed, as we know it today. Had a great levelling effect in other ways, and merchants and wealthy landowners lost their livelihoods and had to start afresh. And the final part is how we remember the Fire of London. And the monuments to the Fire of London are fascinating. Now, do you know much about the monuments to the Fire I do. of London? No. Right, okay. So the main monument, completed in 1677, added to, is a Doric column at the junction of Monument Street and Fish Street Hill now. Okay. So big, big towering yep. column, and it's got a flaming ball at the top. There was much debate whether there should have been a phoenix or Charles oh, II. Oh, like a phoenix. We like a phoenix. London rising from the ashes. London, I think that was Christopher Wren who was suggesting mm. that. But now it's just a, it's a ball of sort of flaming fiery-ish. Okay. That monument is there today. You can nice. go and see it in London. The monument is also a zenith telescope. I don't know what that is. It is a telescope that points straight up. There is a hidden laboratory beneath that monument. That's fucking cool. There is a ticket office. There is a trap door under the ticket office. You go downstairs. You go down steps into a... You, actually, you can actually go and visit it now. You can't as a member of the public, but journalists have gone down there. <gasps> this weird, smelly kind of cave. That's really cool. Yeah, down there. And there is a hole in the ceiling. And if you look up, there's a trap door that you can open at the top of the monument. And it points to the sky. Oh, that's, that's very smart. That's how they built it. They built scientific as well as a monument. Like it. Yeah. You can go to the top of the monument. There is a walkway around the big flaming ball. It's got a mesh cage around it because there were a number of suicides in the late 1700s, early uh, 1800s. People got up I there and I don't know this monument at all. I must go. Oh, I must. Next yeah, time in London, I'll, I'll show you a picture of it. Yeah. It's probably one that you've passed a million times. Maybe so, yeah. The funny thing about the monument as well is that... So, Monument Street and Fish Street Hill. So, it's not know. far from... It's literally... The, the height of it, 202 feet, That's quite tall. is the distance it is from Pudding Lane, from where the fire started. Um, so you're in the city of London. City of London. Yeah. The inscriptions around it, initially, one details how the fire started. Initial things, completely blamed... All the foreigners. Yeah, yeah, all the foreigners and everything like that. Blame the Catholics and the Papists yeah, for definitely. it. Yeah, Yeah. They were removed in the 1800s. <laughs> there may still be references in there, but yeah, there we are. So that is one monument. But there's another monument. There is another monument of where it ended. The Golden Boy of Pie Street. The Golden Boy of Pie Street. I'm not familiar with him either. Yeah, near Smithfield. Marks the spot where the fire ended. And this is on the corner of a building. It's got a golden boy. Little naked cherub. Like it's really out. Mm. It's disturbing. Covered in gold. And the inscription reads, The boy of Pie Corner was erected to commemorate the staying of the Great Fire, which, beginning in Pudding Lane, was ascribed to the sin of gluttony. Mm. When not attributed to the papists, as on the monument. 
The boy was made prodigiously fat to enforce the moral. He was originally built into the front of the public house called the Fortune of War. Oh, nice. We've been there before. <laughs> Which used to occupy the site and was pulled down in 1910. That just goes off on a tangent. <laughs> the Fortune of War was the chief house of cool north of the river for resurrectionists and body snatching days. Years ago, the landlord used to show the room where on the benches around the walls, bodies were placed and labelled with the snatcher's names, waiting till the surgeon at St. Bartholomew's could run round and appraise them. Oh, nice. I like that. So that is where the monument, the monument where was. It's, and they've just gone off on a tangent going, you know, there were body snatchers was... as well. well. This pub is far more interesting than the Great Fire. <laughs> But one of the most famous things about the Great Fire of London, apart from the fire itself... Apart from the fire. ...was that it was one of Nostradamus's predictions. Mm. And he wrote a hundred years earlier, the blood of the just will be lacking in London, burnt up in the fire of 66. The ancient lady will topple from her high place. Many of the same sect will be killed. That is the story okay. of the Great Fire. No, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to not a drama here. <laughs> who, who is the, who is this great lady? Well, the great lady. There's lots of people contesting that is Great Lady London herself. Right. Is the great lady power? Is the great Britannia? Lady... Oh, so, so, Britannia? That was before Britannia, though, wasn't it? That was a Victorian thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that would be before before all that. The great lady would topple. Whether it is health, whether it's uh, you know, whether it's wealth. Or anything, London herself will fall. Some people have said that. It's it's a bit. I really can't yeah. find a definitive idea about it. But okay. there were there were other theories about what started the Great Fire of London, as well as you know your man, the crazy French watchmaker who said I did it. I did it. It was all me. Lots of people think it was a genuine attack. Attack. Yeah, they did. Lots of people think it was the Freemasons. Well, they they did an awful lot of shit. Based entirely on the fact that Christopher Wren was a pre Freemason. Yeah. And well, then he would redesign <laughs> he would redesign the city, so it's in his interest to burn it down. But then also, I mean, one of the great things I which may be a fallacy that I've heard, sort of a see. Yes, that the whole city was, was burnt to a crisp. Therefore, great opportunity to write, make it really modern and mm. new and all this sort of stuff. And sort of lay it out on like a nice grid system like Paris was all gritty. Yes, and stuff like that. Nice, make it all nice. very organised. But they took such a fucking long time deciding on it. <laughs> Everyone else by this point was like, fuck it, I'm going to build my house where it used to be. <laughs> and then all the old little wiggly streets and everything. I was just like, oh, they're back again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of argument. Yeah. There was a lot of arguments around the time about how they should do the redesign. We're going to make it like really neat, like New York, sort of like nice oh, yeah. straight we're rows do this, and things. And, we're going to do that. and it's like, no, it's just a complete botch of wiggly <laughs> lines everywhere. People say, so yeah, people say Freemasons, obviously, because yeah, obviously. They, they were Jack the Ripper yep. as well. People say it was Charles II himself. Well, he needed a bit of a popularity boost, didn't he? Yeah. So come out and, and Nothing rescue like people. Nothing like a tragedy. Nothing like a tragedy, absolutely. Something yeah. to rally the people around him. Whether he was there himself throwing bombs through windows. I'm not sure. Oh, having his people do it. <laughs> having his he, he people. He has people. He had people. He's not he there in a big moustache and a disguise going, ha ha. Uh, maybe it really was a foreign enemy who just threw a bomb into a bakery knowing what was happening and picked the perfect time to do it. Maybe. Mm. Uh, maybe. But I don't know. It it's just a man, terrible, terrible accident. Well, I, think, I think if you're going to... Oh, I don't know. Perhaps it's, it's my un strategic mind <laughs> i'm thinking if i'm a foreign enemy i'm going to go and attack i mean your attacks are more important so well, i well i suppose yeah. i suppose or if i'm going i there's no point going after the tower of london because i'm not gonna be able to get that well i don't, I don't know do you just go and chuck a grenade through a bakery window and hope for the best well i mean i guess it doesn't take a lot of thought to go okay london it will go up in flames yeah. There is a really strong wind. It doesn't take you to be a genius to work that out, no. quite frankly. All right. <laughs> no, this, it's like there's wind. Sorry. There's fucking wind. <laughs> Will this destroy London? Will this create a Ferrari? Mm. But fire is not a big thing. Everyone exp experienced fire well, many, many, many yeah. times. It's not a, it's not so a, it's, it's not just a accidental thing. and it's just a shitty thing. I, I'm th I'm leaning down the line. It was it was just an accident. And it may well have been from the baker. Yeah, a spark from the oven yeah. that wasn't correctly dampened or something many people um, think that now because they can't really think a, of like well wh yeah exactly why would you attack a bakery yeah in pudding lane why wouldn't you do something near to parliament yeah exactly well you would attack yeah. you would attack the docks you would attack a the fortification palace was, the, palace the palace was affected or, no no it wasn't um, it burned down 
Yeah, but mm. yeah. we forget how many times these things were burned down. Well, and they were like, "Oh, rebuild that." Just shit. rebuild it again. Yeah, but just an unfortunate accident that rain yeah. free. Well, what do you think, people? What do you think of the story of the Great Fire of London? There were some horrific crimes that were committed during the Great Fire of London. Not only was there looting and robbing and people taking advantage of people, but there was xenophobia. There oh, was yeah. out and out racism. Of people. This is England, dear. Of course there is. <laughs> People being murdered in the street because they suspected them vaguely of maybe having something to do with something a long time ago. And now, oh my God, we're affected. Which is quite disturbing. Could it have been a plot by the papists? Could it have been a plot by the Catholics in Europe? Could it have been just a simple accident? Or could it have been a delicious plot by Christopher Wren working with Charles II? <laughs> also, Isaac Newton was involved. And the Illuminati were there too. The Illuminati were involved. <laughs> did they burn down London so they could create it in thine own image? Well, yes. that, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> well, there's lots of symbols now across London. Tell us what you think. Jump on the comments. What, what, I, what I oh, want to know, okay. I, what I want to know from people is what are you burying? You, you, <laughs> you've, you've got your wife and the kids and the cats out. You've, you've, you've buried them. Yeah, you've buried them for already. What are you? What are you buried? What are you running out with in a great fire situation? So you're basically saying like, what are the things you save in a fire? Yeah. Okay. So apart apart from your husband and your wife and your kids, fine. Okay. Love living Lo- beings aside, loved ones aside, and pets. Fine. Okay, so for me, it's my it's it's my husband and my pets. Yep. Okay. So, so they're, 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 safe. they're safe. They're safe. Get my so cat, what's what's your parmesan? Oh, that's a really good question. I think my instinct is, oh, it's really, it's my laptop of books. No, okay. Honestly, no. you probably would grab a laptop because it's got all of your shit it on it. It has all your shit on it. It's got that's all of your true, shit absolutely. on it. Absolutely. You know, I'm probably going to be holding my phone anyway, yeah. filming it. <laughs> <laughs> I will be TikTok of the whole thing. Oh, but... yeah. Ooh, look at me. Oh my God, hashtag burning. Yeah. Oh God, now I have to think about yeah. it. Now, yeah. So I, it's, it's, I think it's... instinct would kick in. Instinct would kick in. And I'm, <laughs> we're, we're similar because we, we have all our feelings in a box <laughs> that's in a cupboard. Because you'd, go for, you'd go for the cup of the box. I, d- I think, I'm, oh yeah. I think really in hindsight, I'd think about that later going, oh shit, I should have got that. should have got that. <laughs> I probably get, I don't know I've got Django's fur something from my, my, this is my lost time, you don't really have sort of like people don't have photo albums for things everything's digital and on phones well, some people and things. have like beautiful photos yeah, on so, the wall but yeah. you can always have a copy of that can't it's you a, it's a yeah sort of photo it's an, inter- an interesting thought but what would your what so would you say I, I, I mean I really don't know actually because I, I don't have like photo Ooh. albums and stuff like that yes there are boxes of photographs which yeah. are probably the only sort of irreplaceable thing yeah that I've got here pictures and books and our computers and all that sort of stuff can be yeah. replaced but I suppose they, there's a box of photographs <laughs> so that that'd probably be the thing that I would probably oh, want God. to get to well, we both save the box we both we? save the box the box that we never look at yeah. but we know it's there but we know it's there so <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That Interesting. And also, if I had a lot of cheese in the fridge, the I booze. would actually save it. The, yeah. the chartreuse. Yeah. The chartreuse the sh- is no, damn no, expensive. The chartreuse. Well, yeah. the, the green stuff is fucking impossible to get hold on now. I mean, yeah. Because of those monks. If there was tequila in there, I'd be like, well, that's just going to inflame it. And also, I want to drink while I'm watching this. So, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm out with the shot. I love this fire. Box of, that box is of really... photographs. Under... The fire is really understanding. Yeah. It's like, you got, you got 10 you seconds, got, you, got, you got 10 minutes. to go make up your mind. Come on. <laughs> oh, well. Well, that's anyway. an extra thing. <laughs> Tell us what you think. People jump on the comments of this episode. Tell us what you would save in the fire. <laughs> but also your thoughts and feelings and musings about the Great Fire of London. Do you think it was a pure accident? Do you think it was a conspiracy? Oh, lean into it if you have thoughts and feelings. Are there any, any other weird facts about the Great Fire of London that you would like to share? But most importantly, while you're doing all of this, you must fix up a chocolate biscuit. A chocolate biscuit. It was delicious. It was damn You've had two. I have. I you have. Knocked them back. I have. I hope this made sense. It's, it's been marvellous. Well, the recipe, well, yes, we'll be out this evening for the dear old chocolate biscuit. Chocolate biscuit optional, but I you know, heartily encourage you to add said biscuit mm. to the drink. But yeah, it's a nice, simple one. People should have this stuff. Go for it. Do it and have more biscuits. Send us more biscuit pictures as well. <laughs> as we've said before, please contribute any thoughts you have for episode 200. If you haven't already, leave us a review on Apple iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast and consider joining us on patreon.com because that's where we get really weird and do extra stuff. Mm. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are... 
trying to kill you. Bye.